So I want to start by giving a huge uh, welcome to all of you um, attending our first Paleo Climate Society virtual seminar and a big big thank you to Gordon for kicking kicking this off. So this is a great opportunity for the UK Paleo Climate Society to get together in these strange times, but we were just saying we hope hope that this is something that we can continue going forwards. Um, this paleo climate seminar series is going to look at lots of different paleo climate topics over a range of geological timescales. So I'm really excited to see this come to fruition. And I want to give a huge thank you to Amy Thomas Sparks, Aidan Starr and Sophie Slater, who have been absolutely tremendous actually doing all the legwork and organising this seminar series themselves. So they are wonderful paleo climate ECR researchers at Cardiff University and you'll be seeing more of them in this series. So with that I'm going to hand over to Amy. Thanks Gary. Okay so um, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping before we, we kick off properly. Um, so our talk today is going to be around 30 minutes um, followed by about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for questions. Um, Aidan and Sophie are going to be running our Q&A session this week um, and we're using the webinar format which means that you can engage with the Q&A session in a few different ways, um, either by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen or the chat function, or you're still able to raise your hand. Um, and if you raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can actually speak to ask your question. Um, there's a few people and people continually filing in. Um, so if you do raise your hand and we don't see you and you think we may have missed you, just pop a little comment in the chat and um, let us know that you'd like to speak. Okay, so without further ado, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome um, Gordon, um, Dr. Gordon Inglis. He completed his BSc in Earth Science at the University of Glasgow uh, before completing his PhD in Organic Geochemistry at the University of Bristol in 2015. Um, Gordon completed four years of postdoc research in Bristol before his move to the University of Southampton, where he's currently a Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Fellow within the Department of Ocean and Earth Science. Gordon's research focuses on reconstructing environmental change during past warm high CO2 climates um, and today Gordon will talk to us about climate biogeochemistry feedback during the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. Thank you so much Gordon and welcome. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen, make sure we're good. So can one of you just confirm you can see my slides? Yep, okay, perfect. I'm also going to turn off my video because my broadband is poor. Right, um, so yeah, thanks very much to Carrie, uh, to Amy, Sophie and Aidan for inviting me to come to open the seminar series, no pressure. Um, and what I'm going to present today is work that was uh, funded by the ERC, uh, which was a grant awarded to Rich Pankost back in 2015 um, and has been supported by some funds from the Royal Society uh, over the last year or so uh, whilst I was at Southampton. And the focus of that project and also of my own research is to understand the impact of higher CO2 upon the wider Earth system. So moving beyond just temperature to look at things like the hydrological response to warming and a range of different biogeochemical feedbacks. Um, and whether these act as positive or negative feedbacks in the Earth system. So for this talk today, I'm going to tackle a single biogeochemical feedback, namely terrestrial methane cycling, and explore how that behaved in the past um, during different warming events and whether or not it might have been an important uh, amplifying mechanism during these past warm climate intervals. So. Before we go into the depths of the PETM, I just wanted to step back very briefly, um, if my slides will change. There we go. Um, to just think a little bit about paleoclimates in general, obviously this is the paleoclimate series. Um, and there's been a couple of papers recently which really kind of hammer home the utility of past climates for thinking about the future. So this is a, 
a schematic from a, a review paper that Jess Tierney wrote last year showing us that past climates essentially span a huge range of CO2 conditions from CO2, which might have been lower than modern, to those which are even higher than the most extreme uh, emission scenarios. And OK, past climates are not perfect analogues for the future, but we can use them to look at how different processes respond under different CO2 concentrations and ultimately, you know, use this to validate climate models, which we will then use to predict the future. So it's important to, um, you know, give credit to paleoclimate and how it can inform the future. Uh, and a nice example, which actually coincidentally Carrie was uh, the lead author on, was the recent Geological Society uh, report on climate change, showing us how we can use simple-ish metrics like atmospheric CO2 and global temperatures to improve our understanding of paleo and future climate. So what we're looking at here are two panels. On the left, we're looking at uh, temperature versus CO2 across a range of climate states. So from the last glacial maximum, which is colder than today, to things like the early Eocene up in the far right-hand corner, considerably warmer than today. And so this shows you know, a nice coupling between CO2 and temperature over these you know, range of different timescales, short, long-term, transient events. And it can also be used to um, assess key climate metrics, things like climate sensitivity. So these are shown uh, on the right-hand side panel. These contours are our estimates of climate sensitivity from the geological past. So the temperature rise for a doubling in CO2. And although there is you know, a variety of uh, things to consider, like state dependency and background state, generally the paleoclimate record supports IPCC predictions of you know two to four and a half degrees warming uh, for a doubling of CO2. So, you know, we can use the paleoclimate data, which is real world data from the past, to help constrain the future. Uh, in the talk today, I want to focus in on one of these specific climate intervals. So that's the, the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, um, which, um, as we will see, is one of the most useful paleoclimate states that we can use to think about the future. So we might refer to the PTM as a, as a climate aberration because it represents almost, you know, geologically instantaneous warming event. So, you know, about 10,000 to 100,000 years of rapid warming, which was globally widespread and which coincides with the input of uh, light carbon into the atmosphere. So analogous to what we might be seeing today with the caveat that it's still up to 10 times slower than modern. So important to put this in context that uh, perhaps what we are doing today is, you know, the PTM, but more so. Um, and this figure on the bottom shows us what the, the PETM looks like in the sedimentary record 56 million years ago. So uh, we have a couple of different uh, uh, metrics here looking at carbon isotopes uh, in blue and oxygen isotopes in red from uh, foraminifera or, or bulk carbonate, showing us the, the anatomy of the PETM. So we have this very rapid onset over you know, 10,000 years maximum where we reach uh, maximum temperatures, uh, you know, and then we have this long body, uh, which is about 100,000 years, where we have consistent uh, input of CO2 into the atmosphere, and then this long-term gradual recovery. Um, and, you know, this, the carbon isotopes tells us that we're pumping light carbon into the atmosphere, and some of the consequences of that are that global temperatures rise significantly during the PTM. So this is um, a figure grabbed from a paper we had out last year, a big multi-author uh, study trying to reconstruct global mean temperatures during uh, these warm climates. Uh, and these are just some, uh, some maps showing us essentially uh, temperatures from the pre-PTM, so the latest Paleocene to the PTM. Uh, and regardless of the methods that we use to reconstruct temperature, we have about six in total, the, the take home message is the same, that global temperatures increase between about four and six degrees during this interval. So we know that, and I would say as a community, we are, we've developed many temperature records and we're quite 
confident about the temperature response during the PTM. Some of the other consequences uh, which will feed into this talk is thinking about the hydrological cycle. So uh, this is a figure taken from a uh, paper by Matt Carmichael, who worked with Dan uh, Lunt and Rich Pankost, showing us model simulations across a range of CO2 um, values. And on the y-axis, we have global temperatures and also global precipitation rates. So as you increase CO2, you increase temperatures. We know that. On the right-hand side, we can also see that the hydrological cycle changes in a, a predictable way. So we have more rainfall in a warmer climate. Um, and there's also a very strong coupling, not shown here, between temperature and precip too. But the regional hydrological response is actually quite variable. And, and perhaps there is more nuance than what these global values predict. So, you know, for about 10 or 15 years now, people have been generating records of the hydrological cycle during the PTM, and it broadly conforms to what's called the wet gets wetter, dry gets drier hypothesis. So there is certainly evidence from the mid to the high latitudes that these regions become wetter in response to higher CO2 and higher temperatures, with some, although I would say limited evidence for drying in the low latitudes. Um, and this is something that we're, we're looking at Southampton, trying to explore this in new model simulations or whether this holds true. There's certainly evidence from the Pliocene that perhaps the subtropics became wetter, um, but that is the focus of perhaps another talk. Um, the key thing about the hydrological temperatures is that they will influence a wide range of biogeochemical cycles. So whether that is increased input of sediments into the marine realm, impacts on nutrient delivery, how that might then impact the algal community, the distribution of your forearms, your coccolis, and so on. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on is a specific biogeochemical feedback, which is looking at terrestrial methane emissions and whether or not these increased in response to higher temperatures and perhaps wetter conditions. So today, methane emissions are, uh, can have you know, a natural or an anthropogenic source, obviously in the Eocene, purely natural. And from what we know today, that is most likely coming from these wetland environments shown here. So these swampy anoxic settings where organic matter is decomposing uh, and is being released into the atmosphere as methane, maybe also being then oxidized to CO2. Now, why methane? Well, we're interested in it because of its importance as a greenhouse gas. So. It's relatively a small component of the greenhouse gas budget, but it's far more powerful um, than CO2, at least on a, a, a mole per mole basis. So about 40 times more powerful over about 20 year timescales. It also plays a role uh, in different atmospheric chemistry processes, but really we, we're interested in it because it has the capacity to increase global temperatures um, and potentially act as a, a positive feedback mechanism during the PETM. And then potentially this could you know, provide insights into how the modern methane cycle is likely to respond as we pump more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. So as you will see in a few slides, we've had to rely upon uh, Earth system models to understand how the methane cycle operated in the past. And Relatively few studies have, have looked at this because it's complex and it involves coupling Earth system models with atmospheric chemistry models and vegetation models, and that's not really the norm for the Eocene. Um, so this is, a, I would say, probably the landmark paper looking at from a modeling perspective by David Beerling and others, showing us the changes in trace greenhouse gas emissions during the Eocene at two different CO2 levels. Um, so we got a variety of different greenhouse gases, but we would just focus on methane right now. Uh, and what this tends to suggest is that it, we have at least a four to six times increase in methane emissions during the Eocene. I would argue this could be even higher because of some of the models we employ uh, for this study tend to uh, reconstruct colder temperatures than the most recent suite of models. So this is probably a minimum estimate. And the question is, well, why is this happening? So there's two hypotheses. 
Uh, and these could both be true. Uh, so the first is that during the Eocene under warmer and wetter conditions, we just have greater wetland extent. You know, wetlands typically thrive in these waterlogged environments, and we can see this in the sedimentological record as well. So this is a, a figure taken from a paper by Wilton um, in uh, GMD, I think it was, showing us the distribution of coal deposits during uh, the Eocene. And based upon this and, and some numerical estimates, they suggest the Eocene wetland extent was about two to two and a half times greater than we see today. So if we have more wetlands, we have more methane. That makes sense. The other option, or you know, could also be working in combination, is that as we increase temperature, we um, stimulate the production of methane within these wetlands. We know that hydrology is also likely to play a role. And that could act as, a, as another source of enhanced methane during the PTM. Um, and this is, a, this is a nice figure from a modern meta-analysis of wetlands showing us essentially methane emissions on the y-axis increasing uh, as a function of temperature. And uh, although this, uh, the magnitude of the increase is unclear from this figure, it's um, quite a, a significant increase um, as we increase temperature. Um, Obviously, if temperature is increasing methane emissions, methane emissions will increase temperature, and temperature could increase methane emissions. And so this sort of positive feedback loop uh, could potentially initiate. But the problem that we have faced as a proxy community is that we don't have any proxies to reconstruct methane concentrations or even to probe the methane cycle. So ice cores have been the go-to archive um, because you can actually measure atmospheric CO2, looking at the bubbles, but that's restricted to essentially the quaternary. Um, the alternative is a more indirect measure, so looking at the distribution of ancient wetlands, but as with most terrestrial sections, the age control is tricky, um, and there's also potential sampling bias uh, in that as well. So to try and resolve this, um, whilst I was at Bristol, we turned to a suite of um, organic molecules called hopanoids. Now, these are often referred to as the most abundant natural products on Earth. Um, these are very uh, common, abundant molecules produced by most, but not all, aerobic bacteria. So um, they are found in soils, peats, rivers, lakes, you name it, you will find these compounds. Um, so what we were interested in was trying to look at some of the sources of these, these hopanoids. So what was interesting is that methanotrophic bacteria, so these are bacteria which use methane as their energy substrate, well, they can produce a, a suite of diagnostic and non-diagnostic hopanoids. So a couple of these are shown here. On the left is a, is a more diagnostic lipid, um, which tells us about the presence of a specific type of methanotrophs. So potentially we could look at the abundance of this compound to reconstruct methanotroph biomass in the past, but these compounds are very uh, susceptible to degradation. And so their application in, you know, the Pliocene, the Miocene further back is tricky. Um, so instead we rely upon their degradation products shown on the right, which are far more recalcitrant. It's just carbon and hydrogen. And so they're more likely to be preserved over long timescales. And so what we did was to try and first ground truth of this approach before we applied it in the geological realm. And the approach we are using is to uh, kind of employ the principle, which is you are what you eat as a microbe. So in wetlands, we have the decomposition of organic matter, and this produces methane. And this methane will have a very light isotopic composition, so anywhere between minus 50 to minus 90 per mil. Now this methane can, can escape into the atmosphere, it can diffuse uh, through the peatland, but it can also be consumed by these bacteria living within the wetlands. Uh, and because this methane is light, this uh, light isotopic composition is built into the biomass and built into the lipid biomarkers themselves. So the take home message would be that um, a shift towards lower carbon isotope values in these bacterial lipids, we would interpret for enhanced methanotrophy in the past. And we 
a study looking at these lipids in a suite of modern wetlands to try and establish what is the modern range of isotope values in these methanotroph biomarkers. And we found that these would rarely go below minus 45 per mil. In a, in a sense saying that if we go to the Eocene or the PETM and we apply this approach, these methanotroph lipids, if these are lower than minus 45 per mil, we have evidence that the methane cycle is more intense than we observe in modern settings. Now, before we show you the PETM data, there is one caveat, and that is what this proxy is looking at is the consumption of methane by bacteria. It tells you nothing about how much methane is going into the atmosphere. So that's the caveat, but there is certainly evidence from experimental studies showing you that as you increase methane flux from experimental peatlands, you also have an increase in methane consumption. So we have um, the argument that an increase in methane oxidation should also tell us about meth you know, methane production and flux into the atmosphere. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind. So there was some previous work applying this approach to the paleocene acine thermal maximum. This was work that Rich did back in 2007 applying this to a ancient wetland uh, from Cobham in the UK, showing that during the onset of the PETM in gray, we have a big shift, a big negative shift in the isotopic composition of these lipids. Now, these values we can reinterpret in terms of the, the modern baseline, and it shows that these are exceptional and completely unlike anything we see in the modern, and up to minus 75 per mil. And the only way we can explain this is enhanced me the enhanced methane oxidation, uh, which we hypothesize, um, or Rich hypothesized, was then um, an indirect indicator for enhanced methane emissions. Um, but whilst the study was, was great, there was no subsequent investigations, mainly because getting good, well-constrained records of the PETM on land is tricky. And we also were unable to understand the relationship between methane cycling and temperature in this setting. So to try and explore whether methane cycling was elevated during the PTM and to try and explore what was driving this, um, our colleagues in New Zealand um, had been working on a, a new outcrop section uh, called the Otayo River, which spans the latest Paleocene to early Eocene. And it's a, a suite of uh, coastal, low-lying terrestrial marine deposits. So we have uh, some fluvial deposits interbedded with uh, wetland uh, deposits and some shallow marine archives too. And we applied a, a dual approach. So using the organic geochemistry and the isotopes to look at the methane cycle, but also employing uh, branched GDGTs, which are uh, membrane lipids produced uh, by bacteria which change their structure as a function of uh, temperature. So we could use this to, to interrogate methane cycling and to try and understand the, the environmental controls which were responsible uh, for any changes. So uh, this is uh, just taken from the paper actually showing us just initially the bulk organic record. Uh, we also have this uh, bulk Right, no. We also have the carbon isotopes for the leaf wax biomarkers. They show essentially the same picture, uh, but I've just removed that here so it's a bit simpler to read. So what we have here on the, uh, the y-axis is depth and uh, different age uh, constraints as well. So one of the, the things that is very tricky is to ac accurately identify the PTM uh, in these terrestrial settings, but we're convinced that we have enough evidence to, to place the PTM within this section. So what we have uh, between about you know, five and 10 meters is this characteristic negative carbon isotope excursion of about two or three per mil, which is quite characteristic for uh, these sort of organic lean terrestrial sections. We have a change from Paleocene to early Eocene pollen. We have the incursion of thermophilic taxa, we have palm pollen during the PTM, 
we have evidence for sea level rise. We have the dominance of apectidinium, which is a, a dinoflagellate, which we often see in the high latitudes during the onset of the PTM. And we also have temperature rise, which we will see uh, in a few slides. So we're pretty happy that we've got the PTM. There is probably uh, some sort of unconformity between the top of the PTM and the early Eocene which might explain why the, the carbon isotopes don't recover to a sort of pre-PTM level. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think we're good. So we then applied our uh, methanotroph proxies in this section. We looked at a suite of different, uh, different hopinoids, um, but the, there are some differences between the different lipids. And if there's any organic geochemists in the audience, they can, they can certainly ask why this is. I might have an answer. Um, but the key message here is that we see a, a negative carbon isotope excursion in our methanotroph biomarkers during the onset of the PTM. The values themselves are below minus 45 per mil. So this is essentially outside of the modern range and tells us that the, the rates of methane oxidation are higher than we see today. But what's interesting from this study, which we didn't see in, for example, the Cobham lignite, is that we also have um, you know, evidence from after the PTM. And so the methane cycle appears to be perturbed right at the start of the, the event, but then return, returns to essentially pre-PTM values during the early Eocene. Uh, and the reason this is a little bit surprising is that temperatures during the PTM and during the early Eocene are both essentially the same, around 20 to 25 degrees. So this is um, our branch GDGT record shown in panel C. Uh, there are a number of uh, intricacies to this record, but generally um, what this tells us is that methane cycling, which increases during the onset of the PTM, is decoupled from our temperature record. Um, we don't know exactly why, but what it tells us is that Perhaps it is the, uh, the rate of warming, which is particularly crucial for perturbing the methane cycle. So it's not necessarily warmer temperatures equals more methane. It could also be to do with the, uh, the existence of these climate perturbations, which drive this. Of course, there could be other controls, which we don't know in this day. Um, particularly the hydrological cycle is probably a key culprit in, in driving this. We certainly know from nearby sites that uh, the New Zealand region was characterized by quite an unstable hydrological cycle during the PTM with you know, alternations between wet and dry cycles. Um, and based upon what we've seen in the Holocene, um, certainly these dry and wetting cycles can really um, impact uh, methanotropy. So, you know, future work should certainly try and understand the environmental drivers, but the, the key message regardless is that both in Cobham in the UK and the tile in New Zealand is that during the PTM, the methane cycle was unlike anything we see today. And what is you know, most fascinating is that it is changing right at the onset of the PTM. We see that at Cobham, the lowest values are right at the onset, and we see that at Otile as well. So there are a number of implications of some of this work. So what this suggests is that methane cycling may have been quite an important feedback during the PTM, at least during the onset. And those Earth system models, which include methane cycling within them, indicate that this can contribute maybe 20% of additional warming for a doubling of CO2. So this is an important feedback that we should be incorporating into models, whether that is by including methane or by increasing CO2 to kind of account for this. And it can also increase our estimates of Earth system sensitivity by almost at one degree centigrade. So that's that's quite a big, a big shift. And so it's all suggesting that we need to think about terrestrial methane cycling and we need to start to integrate this within the models uh, earlier on in the development process. Now just to finish, I just want to show a couple of unpublished uh, slides because the findings of our, our studies from the PTM really suggested that it was the, the, the rate of change 
which was important for warming. So we wanted to test this by placing this within the context of the longer term climate trends. So uh, working with uh, folk at Bristol, Victoria and David, uh, and working with many collaborators uh, across the world, we obtained lots of new uh, terrestrial wetland deposits, which span the Paleocene and the Eocene, to see whether or not we also see evidence for methane cycle perturbations uh, during this interval. Uh, the take home message is that, that we don't. Um, so what we're looking at here um, on, on the left is the oxygen isotope record of benthic foraminifera. So essentially a record of deep sea temperatures during the Eocene. We have the PTM highlighted in gray and we can see our, uh, our methanotroph biomarkers showing this big shift towards lighter values. But if we look in the early Eocene, which is arguably as warm as the PETM, we don't see any evidence for enhanced methane cycling, um, which is perhaps a little bit puzzling um, and certainly uh, fits with the hypothesis that it's the, the rate of change which is important. Uh, but I think the key thing here is that it doesn't mean that methane emissions are not elevated during the late Paleocene or the early Eocene, because we know that wetland extent was also much higher during these intervals. So. Um, Essentially, the PETM will, will contribute more methane than what we saw in the early years. Um, and so this also has, I guess, a number of implications, which is that it's clear that the methane cycle operates differently depending upon whether this is a rapid or a slow warming event, um, which is important because most of the climate models that we use during the Eocene essentially simulate steady state conditions um, because computationally that's kind of what they, they can do. Um, but it does suggest that looking at transient simulations uh, is, is something that we should be doing. And also it has some implications for the future because what we are doing today is even more rapid than the PETM, maybe 10 times more, more rapid. So if we're seeing these responses during the PETM, it's probably likely that we'll see something similar in the future. Uh, so moving forward, um, just to wrap up, I think there is a lot that can still be done to understand methane cycling in the past on land. Um, some of the work going on at Bristol, for example, Jerome, uh, one of uh, Richie's and David's PhD students has been looking at trying to develop novel biomarkers to look at not methane consumption, but methane production and potentially tying these two approaches together will allow us to say something more nuanced about methane emissions. Um, and I think it's clear that we also need to integrate the modeling data um, where we can. There's been some really nice work from the Pliocene uh, by Peter Hopcroft showing that, that methane is an important feedback mechanism and we see it in the Eocene. Um, we just need more models to be, to be applying these uh, slightly more complex feedbacks. And there's also opportunities to apply this in other time intervals, this particular approach, whether that's Holocene peatlands, lignites and coals. You know, these biomarkers are preserved back to the Carboniferous. So, you know, they are, you know, you might not want to go that far back, but essentially you could be looking at methane cycling throughout, you know, parts of the Mesozoic as well. And I think where this might be most useful is in marginal marine sediments where you have lots and lots of terrestrial organic matter being flushed into the marine realm. And if you can assess the contribution from peatlands, then you can use that potentially say something about methane cycling on land. The added bonus being that you have much better age control than what you have uh, on land. Um, so we have some work coming from, uh, from Wilkes Land in Antarctica, which shows that this might be uh, an interesting approach in the future. Right, so I will finish up there. I will just leave these uh, highlights on the screen um, because I think uh, I've discussed these all in detail. Uh, and for those that are interested, this was published in uh, Geology back at the start of the year. And if, uh, if you can't get a copy, let me know and I'll, I will send it over. And thank you all for listening. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Gordon. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Aidan and Sophie now, who are going to run our Q&A session.
Hi, yeah, thanks, Gordon. Uh, we've got a question here from Charlotte Slaymark. Um, are there any other warming periods where there are associated changes in methane, like glacial, interglacial? Okay, so I just want to say a final thank you to everybody for uh, for joining us today, and obviously the biggest of thank yous to Gordon. That was a fantastic talk to kick off the seminar series. So thank you so much. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that our next virtual seminar will be taking place on Wednesday, the 2nd of June, uh, the same time, 3 p.m., um, where we'll be welcoming uh, Dr. Chiruta Kulkarni. Um, keep an eye on our social media pages and our website um, for an updated uh, title and abstract for that talk. Um, and just one more little bit of uh, housekeeping. If anybody would like to volunteer to give a talk during the seminar or has a burning desire to nominate someone that they think would give um, a good talk, then again, you can get in touch with us um, either by sending us a message on Twitter or by emailing us. Um, our email address is paleoclimatesociety at gmail.com. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Gordon. Hope everyone has a fantastic rest of the week. Thank you so much for that, Gordon. That was fantastic. Yep, that's all right.